can record now. Oh, there we go. Okay, so lighthearted guide for the heavy hearted employee. Um, I tried to write it more of a humorous style because it was more fun, right? I want to enjoy sitting and, and writing this book. And I liked making myself giggle as I was thinking of really stupid dad jokes to put in there. And hopefully it made it a little bit more fun to read. The reason why, I don't have to teach you all this, you know, our brains simply absorb information better if we feel like we're hearing a story, right? If we feel like we're being preached at or somebody's trying to shove information down our throats, then we immediately put on that, that force field, right? You put on that armor that says, okay, wait, but is this true? I don't know. Am I ready to absorb information? I don't know if I agree with you. It's just harder for our brains to absorb stuff when it feels like it's it's in a more academic format. So I was hoping that by making it more enjoyable, you might get something out of it. Uh, I wanna come back. To, oh gosh, did you see how far I skipped there? We're just, we're just gonna fly back through these. Okay, so Hawthorne experiments. Um, I'm assuming some of you have heard of these. They're about a hundred years ago at the Hawthorne Works factory. I don't know, they were kind of, they were one of those foundational experiments that, that helped to guide our modern day uh, human resources department. So here's the idea. They, um, they were doing these studies and they looked at two different groups to see who was the most effective. Right, this was 1920s. This was when everything was about productivity. How can we make them the most efficient possible? And so we had like Donna in one factory and Jim in one factory. And they were trying to figure out, okay, is Donna more effective with yellow paint or is Jim more effective with orange paint on the walls? Hmm, inconclusive. All right, what about if we played classical music for Donna and then jazz for Jim? Also inconclusive. So they sat down with the with the researchers and I couldn't find an exact picture of them, but I think this one was pretty close. Their names were Rothels, Berger, and Mayo. So was, you know, this was the closest I could find. And here's what they found, that the employees were simply happier because somebody was listening to them, right? Somebody cared about how they were doing. Somebody cared about their responses and that that was actually the number one determinant of if people were productive, if they were happy, if they were engaged, if they were going to remain in their office. So I thought, I don't know, I thought that this was a, a pretty exciting study and it was pretty exciting about how much of our, again, how much of our HR structure was built off of this, even though we've kind of veered off course a little bit, I think that the original purpose of HR was just, hey, Donna, hey, Jim, I want to hear what's going on. What are your concerns? How can I be helpful? And that when we when we really got back to that, that when we really got back to making employees feel heard and appreciated, then they would be engaged, right? Which makes sense. If I feel like Donna's not listening to me, I'm not going to be engaged with that relationship, right? But if I feel like she cares about me, then suddenly I'm more interested. Um, so a little bit more. Um, I... So I took this data, I took all of these, all the information from the degrees, I took what I learned from some of these different studies about, oh, people want to be heard. And like I've said, I wanted to present it in more of a storytelling format. Okay, my mom is a researcher, my father is a storyteller. And so building on both of those, I decided I want to share data through funny stories. Okay, that was my goal here. Um, I wanna save this for the gender stuff. I wanna skip, there's a couple exciting things I wanna to get to. Okay, so book talks about, we have two main responses to conflict, okay? Um, that when we disagree with somebody that our most common response is, instead of actually dealing with it, like we know we probably should, we slip under it or we slide over it, right? We slip under it by saying things like, I don't want to be difficult, right? I just, I don't want to be seen as a drama queen. It'll probably go away. They'll figure it out on their own. Uh, I, I don't want to, I just don't want to rock out, okay? So that's a typical underreact response. The other common one that we see is an overreact response where somebody just jumps in and they're frustrated and they say, ah, oh, this is just how it's going to be, right? And it's kind of impatient. It kind of says, I don't want to take the time to have a conversation with you. So I'm just going to tell you this is the way it is. I'll be honest, I completely did this yesterday. My 14-year-old 
we're trying to teach him basic life skills, things like, you know, cleaning your room, doing the dishes. And like when you do the dishes, it doesn't just mean you put them on the island for mom to do them, but like you actually have to use soap and some of those things. Okay, so I've been trying to explain, right? Tried to have this lovely conversation about the conflict. And I finally just said, oh my gosh, we could just sink and do the dishes. I know you know what it is, right? And I, I just got frustrated and I used power and I made a quick decision. I said, this is just the way it's going to be. It did not do wonders for our relationship. But the dishes got done, you know, so it might have also been an effective strategy in the moment. Okay, so I want to keep this in mind as we start to talk about gender, right? That our, our two common responses to conflict are we don't really like to actually deal with it because that's kind of scary. That's an unknown. Instead, most of us underreact or most of us overreact. Okay. Mm, I have a couple more slides, but I don't want to go there yet. First, I want to check in with the lovely people that we have here today. Hello, hello, everyone. So, uh, dear, hello, so many lovely faces. Hello, all of you. Um, so I have three lovelies that I invited into this conversation. Um, Donna, you can see there, Donna Silverberg from Pepperdine, and she kind of facilitates everything that's exciting happening in the Northwest. I can just roughly say that, okay. Um, <laughs> Susan, so Susan Guthrie, um, oh, one of the, mute you, there we go. Um, so Susan, really one of the best trainers that I think I've ever heard. So if you have the chance to listen to her, I highly recommend it. Um, because again, her brain, I think your brain kind of works like mine, or at least how I want my brain to work, where you can take that theoretical stuff and say, but how do we make this work? How do we apply it today? Which I just love. And Lucia, um, so Lucia, fantastic negotiator, published author, and um, again, pretty wide variety of experiences in a lot of different fields, international background, lots of, lots of different experiences with negotiation. So I, I purposely picked these three women so that we could all gather together and just have a conversation about this. So with that being said, I'd like to invite all of you to jump in. Hey, Claire, can I just, in the interest of full disclosure here, I think we need to clarify one thing, particularly because we're going to be having gender, you know, discussions here. Was the picture of that hunk in your presentation really your husband when you were talking about <laughs> marital conflict? No, it's not in here, right? Okay, it was not. <laughs> and in defense of Sam, <laughs> in defense of Sam, he's better looking. Than that. <laughs> so See, I'm just trying, funny. I'm trying to process if I'm talking in future presentations about <laughs> marital conflict with my wife, you know, <laughs> you put up your, the, the real wife or, or who, you know, so anyhow, <laughs> I just wanted to clarify uh, which hunk is which. So I, as you know, I use him so often for examples, like, oh, here's the fight that we got into. And here's why he said this. I'm afraid if I start putting his picture out there, people will stop him on the street and say, you know, you really should have taken the trash out. He, he is a really good looking guy. I just want to say. Hungry. Thank you. Mm. I, I think so, personally. So, okay. Claire, um, first of all, you left out that I'm actually a, a recovering uh, employment attorney. So <laughs> I, I have, I think I have seen it all in the <laughs> workplace, like craziest stuff that you wouldn't even think to fictionalize. And um, so as you can see, this book is all tabbed, like side and top tabs, because there's so many. I I was like, I've met that person. I've met that person. I've met that person. I, I've met all of these people, all of these personalities, all these dynamics, not just seen them as an attorney uh, and, and, and a workplace mediator, uh, but experienced them as a yeah. woman in the workplace. And I'm like, Dang, why didn't you? Like, my only complaint is you wrote this too late. Uh, <laughs> I needed this 20 years ago. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Better late than never, though, right, Lucia? Yeah, yeah. And and I don't know about anyone else, but I have actually made the brownie recipe in the back. And uh, Claire, it was now I, I should confess I have two teenage boys and a husband. It was annihilated within 24 hours. Yeah, they're they're so, pretty good. 
Yeah. yeah I did a lot of, I probably researched the brownie recipe more than just about anything else. More than anything else. In the book. Yeah. yeah. Well, that, that stands to reason. So yeah, yeah. that's the exciting stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, good. I, I'm so glad you here. said about people and you said this in your Harvard talk. And I said this, I say this too about negotiations. If people don't want to read a book about it. They just want to know how to do it. Yep. And that that's what this does. And you don't have to read it from start to finish. You you could just you could just flip it open flip and yeah. and you're gonna get a nugget and be like, oh, okay, you know. Um, so it's really practical and and particularly, I think particularly for women and the whole overreact and under underreact thing. It just I'm just relating so much to that too. Because that and the rock that oh, the don't rock the boat thing right? Because weren't we socialized that yeah. don't just don't upset the apple cart. Just right. we should be cooperative. You know, it's one of the reasons that women negotiate their compensation eight times less often than men. Oh, I don't want to be demanding. I don't want to be greedy. Yeah. I don't want to, they're just hiring me. I don't want to be high maintenance right off the, you know, when, when in fact, you're probably failing your first assignment by not counter offering that offer. Right. Yeah. So, so we've got all this emotional mapping that we got to like remap. Yeah, thank you. And she gives us a map for that, right? Exactly. And you I and you've given us the the map. You should have a category for your Amazon. You should put it in the category of like atlases and maps. Right. Uh, I love it. I love it. Exactly. <laughs> um, I thought. Um, I'm, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I I was just gonna say I'm I'm so excited that that was recorded because now I can just have that be like I'm going to share that video probably everywhere I can think of. Thank you, Lucia. That was so kind. Yeah. The, and, and what what I took away, I mean, I, a, I thought it was really thought provoking, right? I mean, we read these books all the time and um, it's like, oh, that was good. This, I thought I found it really thought provoking, Claire. I thought the way that you that it was entertaining, of course. Right. I mean, I was laughing out loud uh, on airplanes as I was reading this <laughs> thing and people kept looking over at me and it was like, oh, no, really, this is you should read this book. Um, and so perceptive. Right. I thought there there was the perceptiveness about the gender issues. Um, the, and, and when we say gender issues, I wanna say on behalf of the way Claire presented it, that it was, she was presenting the traditional, you know, what do we yep. think traditionally? What do we think are feminized and masculinized responses to things? And so then where do people go with it? Um, and the names of, you know, Clueless Carl and the dude and dudette and, you know, some of those. Right. The, the, the that we can all relate to. Gender. Yeah, the labels. I think it was great. Yeah, I was just talking to my students about this last night that one of the beauties of the labels is a you, it gives you something to think about so that you can act, which was part of the point, right? Assess it. What is it? Then act on it. Don't just assess it, but act on it. Um, and and it gives us the opportunity to say, wait, I just put a label on a person, and that Instead label of the behavior, it may be inappropriate, right? That yep. I did it that way. So I felt yeah. like. It, it really does give us tools, really, really active tools in a very funny uh, storytelling way. So I, I want to thank you oh. for putting it together. Thank you. Thank you. It was really fun. Okay, let's talk about, you just started to bring up gender. I want to, to discuss that. So um, I spent a lot of time researching gender and how it relates to conflict. And not surprisingly, most of the gender studies are divided into masculine and feminine. Right. There's starting to be some studies on transgender, binary, et cetera, but it's most of it was based on masculine and feminine. So I, I address that as quickly as I can in the book. Um, I included additional studies wherever I could, but again, there just wasn't as much data there yet. And so I, I think it's important to realize that that a lot of our responses to conflict have to do with how we were treated and how we identified growing up. Right. So um, if you if you transition and we're female presenting from a pretty early age, then you probably identify more with the feminine approaches to conflict. Right. Because that's how you were treated. And I really like the girls, the woman who wrote the girls who code. And she said that if you were treated feminine, then chances are your parents still impose that 1950s expectation of femininity on you, which means you have to be perfect, right? You just, you have to be perfect. You shouldn't expect to take a step forward unless you have done everything beforehand. And I like that example she gave in her TED talk where she said, 
most women will not apply for a job unless they know that they meet 100% of the qualifications, whereas most men won't apply unless they meet 60% of the qualifications. And um, Lucia, I was meeting with Mary Donahue last night, right? She's this uh, publicist who works with female nonfiction authors. And she addressed this very specifically. And she said, it used to be for men and women, but I changed it. And I'm only working with women because they have such a different approach to publicizing their book. So for most of them, they can do the publicity stuff. It's mental. It's them saying, but I didn't write the perfect book. Like I, there's this one spot where I should have said this thing slightly differently. And so it's not perfect. And so I don't want to promote it. And she said, it's a very different approach with men, right? For men, we work more on the strategy and the steps because there isn't as much of that, of that fear that holds them back. And, um, and what, what I love was that she said, what, what a lot of women don't understand is that they have these natural skills, right? They have the skills of empathy, learning, multitasking, that high EQ, and they're walking into a room of very hungry people and they have the food, but they think, oh, maybe I didn't, maybe I didn't prepare it perfectly, so I'm not going to feed them. As opposed to, no, I have all of these skills. I might not know how to present it perfectly, but I still want to share what I can. Just, I really... Anyway, Lucia, thank you for introducing me to Mary. She's just fantastic. Yeah, Mary is, um, and she was formerly, first of all, I have to, just because this is being recorded, I have to correct that she's not a publicist and she would, pursue, right. she's a, because her whole thing is you don't need a publicist. She's a media strategist and media strategy coach. And she used to be with Oprah. She was uh, 10 seasons with, with Oprah. So um, uh, yeah, the whole, when I was uh, recording the audio version of, of my book, I, I came across six things where I was like, oh, that's. I, oh, I wish I could change that. They were just, yeah. I considered to be just kind of mistakes. Like, oh, yeah. You know, oh, well, it's just at a certain point, you just have to move forward. And I I, I want kind of wonder if like Brene Brown has done us all a big favor with the whole like vulnerability thing, you know, like say mm -hmm. like she has really made vulnerability fashionable. Yeah. And, and now in leadership, it's the thing you see it everywhere. Authenticity, vulnerability. So that I think helps us with that remapping to mm -hmm. get up and do that TED talk or go ahead and do that presentation or masterclass or write that essay or that book, knowing that not going to be perfect, you know, but here you go, because there's a lot of gems in here too. And the gems uh, are disproportionate. They disproportionately outweigh the, the, the rocks, you know, <laughs> issues, right? Yeah. Um, so I want to do a quick check in because once, once I had that realization, it was really helpful for me to understand that it was that it was that expectation that I was supposed to be perfect that I realized was causing a lot of conflicts for me. You know, if my husband would say something like, "Oh, did you do the dishes?" I'm instantly defensive, right? Like, no, I had so many things today and don't you know, and you could have done the dishes and and I just didn't have time. And you know that, and he's like, I, I was just wondering, I wanted to know if these were clean from the dishwasher or if I should hit start, right? But I'm instantly assuming he expects me to be perfect. I'm anything less than perfect. So I am becoming instantly upset and defensive, right? So that was a huge realization for me to understand it's my stupid expectations that are getting myself into conflict so often. Um, I don't know. Is that just me? Anybody else? Anybody else's brain work that way? So not just you. <laughs> okay, good. Yeah, good. <laughs> and so, I, you know, I just, it's, I've been sitting here listening and this insight is so, um, so of the moment for me, I've just been spending a lot of time with my niece um, and I'll, I'll niece brag or I'll aunt brag for a minute. She's 25 and graduated uh, just a couple of years ago, and she's just been moving up that little corporate ladder in three years. She is, you know, killing it. She's got, you know, a direct reports, I think, of a 12-person team at 25 years of old, years of age. And then recently, her dream job just opened up, and she looked at the requirements of what they were looking for, and she's like a year shy on the time that they want you to have been in the workplace, but she kills it in every other category. And she immediately in her little perfectionist female mind, if, if we're pulling it together that way, she wasn't going to apply. Hmm. Because she thought they were going yep. to just 
out of hand say no. And, you know, it, it struck me that it's not just our generation um, who I think, yes, we got so socialized by, you know, I remember my grandmother when I told her I wanted to go to law school said, oh, well, good idea since you didn't find a husband in, in undergrad, law school is a good place to find one, right? That was, right. That was, that was her mindset, right? So, but I, I had been hoping that we had some trickle down of, of, um, of a more progressive um, thinking for women, but, you know, and, and maybe it's not um, across the board, but it, it strikes me that we limit ourselves with that perfectionism so much, right? That, that expectation, because I've had that same exact argument or discussion with my husband about the dishes mm -hmm. or did you, you know, mail the whatever, did you pick up the dry cleaning or whatever those things are, which immediately turns into me, you know, in full on, why didn't you do it? Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, I think that um, as much as we think we've made advances, it really strikes me that in so many ways, this is so deeply ingrained mm -hmm. um, and it does carry over into, um, into that workplace. And just another quick story is that your book, is so fabulous and has such wonderful takeaways and actual strategies, but I'm going to um, mirror what I think Donna said, or or it may have been Lucia, but it was um, that it came too late. So I had a very close friend who was dealing with a very difficult boss who had a lot of very hard to manage behaviors. And I gave her another book about working with difficult behaviors and she called, we went out to dinner a couple of days after I gave her the book. And she said, well, I've just got to tell you, I really love the book. Um, and I'm unemployed. Uh, she got fired when she went to the office and took all of her little strategies in the book that I had given her because she went so far from one side of the fence and threw every little strategy she learned basically at him in one meeting. And that meeting ended up with her being unemployed. Um, so I got my friend fired. It turned out well. She ended up finding a much, much better job and was delighted with it. But, um, you know, that's that's one of the gifts of your book. I just wanted to make sure I said that is that she never having read your book, she never would have <laughs> unleashed the barrage. <laughs> yeah, exactly. I wish I'd been in the room just to watch it. It yeah, had to have been a fascinating case study. That would have um, been. Yeah, yeah. I love it. You know, if, if I can uh, intervene just very quickly here, uh, one thing that flashed in my mind is that just from a business perspective, I was thinking we should send Claire on a comedy tour uh, to share this. And then I had an even better idea, which send all four of you on a comedy yes. tour. It would just be hilarious. And I would also yeah. encourage you to consider a podcast along with that. So that's and, you know, I want to, I want to contrast all this, which I love, you know, the humor. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm my secret wish would be to be a stand up comedian uh, as well. But I want to contrast this with going out to chat GPT last night and asking them to share with me the best mediator jokes that they could come up with or mediation jokes. And they were awful, you know, and I would say, come on, you can do better. You know, let's get a little crazy. And they were awful. And it makes me realize the contrast hmm. between, you know, kind of our field normally professionally talking so much was about legitimacy and credibility and professionality and ethics and the like. But, you know, the language that actually gets things through to create change in the world is much different. And we now see, you know, humor works. And what is humor, to be honest with you? It's almost all based on conflict yeah. and, and to some extent anger. I mean, but it, it's kind of the creative expression uh, of those things. And so anyhow, yeah. I think our field, there's a huge gap uh, between how we have traditionally talked about the work we do. Uh, and what really gets through uh, to change yeah. the masses. And, and this has really highlighted that for me. So thank you. That's well, good. we, you know, we laugh, Jim, because otherwise we would cry. Exactly. So as between the two options, I would rather do the former than the latter, or at least more of the former. And, and you're right about the, the reason things are funny. I mean, you didn't put it, put it quite like this, but it's because they're true. 
right? Yeah. You tell people that mm-hmm. it's funny because it's true. Because yeah. like this is all true. You know, right. that's why I was laughing out loud, just like Donna said so many times. Mm-hmm. Um, and people can relate to it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. It's Very relatable. It's people so... have to be able to see themselves in this. Yeah. yeah. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. It was, I could definitely see myself a lot when I was writing it. Um, okay, I've one more leading question for our for our presenters, but also for everyone. So um what's the right way to say this? Uh, I remember Susan, like your story uh, um about your niece. Uh, I remember when I had just got accepted to Pepperdine and I was so excited, right? And I called my grandpa, I was like, it's the number one disability resolution program in the world. And, and he said, you know, that's lovely, but I think you've proven at this point, everything you need to remember, nobody will want to marry you if they think you're smarter than them. So I think you need to not get the degree and, um, and just kind of act playful. And I, and it just, it floored me, right? My grandpa was a computer engineer. That was my first degree. And I was 100% his personality. And I thought we were like simpatico on this. And it, it's one of those moments that just completely stuck in my head where he was like, this is all well and nice, but don't forget you're a woman. That is not your role. You're not supposed to, to be seen this way. And, um, and I'm sure we all have stories like that. Like I remember in different offices where, um, uh, they would say, oh, but, um, I think your main job here is I would ask them about a project. Oh, I don't think that these specs are right. And they said, yeah, but your main job is just to smile and keep the candy dish filled. It's like, but, but it's not. Like I'm the project manager. And so I know that we all have those moments. Um, but, and and so I think as a society, it took us a long time to figure out how do we want to show up in the workplace, right? Because at first we were expected to, women were expected to show up meekly. And then we're like, no, we're just going to jump in. We're going to take it by force, right? And so there was this, this scenario, you know, 80s, 90s, there was like the power woman and she was feminist and she would jump in and she would be tough. But I think we have really settled at a place, thank goodness to the Barbie movie, because anybody, I'm hoping that everyone has seen this. I'm going to try not to give away too many spoilers. I think we've really settled at a place and I think the Barbie movie articulated it where we said, you know, we are coming in with these wonderful feminine qualities that we're super proud of. And we also recognize that you have these lovely masculine qualities that we're also super proud of and we respect those. And how can we bring the best of both of those qualities to the workplace and not feel like we have to excuse or be ashamed of or be less than, right? Or I think I said in the book, sometimes I remember being in offices where I felt like I was in the middle seat of an airplane, right? And I had to just be small and give so that everybody else could take up their space. And I think we've, we're starting to reach a place in society where we're saying, like, I want the aisle seat, actually. I, I have important things to say, and I don't want to diminish that, right? That's not what I was hired to do. Um, Donna, Susan, Lucia, is, is, that, is that syncing with what you're seeing in workplace culture? I, I would say that there's a, I mean, there really is a struggle that's going on between the, between that, what's in, what, what are you coded to? What, what is your family? How the men in the family tell you stories mm-hmm. uh, and, and, and then who you want to be, right? Do you want to be the Barbie? Do you want to be the superwoman? Whatever it is that you're doing there. And, and I see that struggle a lot of, and, and the result of that then is, um, that I'm seeing in, in workplaces, and most of the workplaces that I deal with are in faculty settings, so it's departments of faculty, is that that the women end up taking on way more of the work. I mean, it's just like, it's astonishing yeah. to me how much more faculty women are doing in, mo- in all of the departments I've worked with than the men. The men are kind of dramatic, and um, you know they push into the conversation, but the women are doing all of of what's necessary to keep the, the place afloat. So that it's kind of an interesting observation, and I and I felt like, you know, I, I remember the day that I was sitting in the middle of an airplane, and I finally said, and I know this is being recorded, and sorry, but this is what I said. Fuck it, and I just pushed their elbows off. <laughs> Good. <laughs> Oh, I got a better seat. You guys have another arm you can lean on. I don't, right? Yeah. So, 
Um, but that was, you know, in my thirties, I think that I finally. Mm -hmm. so. Good. Yeah. I've, I've certainly seen it. And uh, of course, and, um, and then it, I, I keep coming back to that, that mapping that I, I've really only become aware of and, the past few years and I'm 52 and I feel like, oh, I wish I had become aware. I wish I'd been more aware sooner. Well, at least now I can maybe mentor, you know, the next generation. And it's, it's like the people pleasing thing where we mm -hmm. just, we try so hard and then we try harder and we try harder and we try harder to go above and beyond. And, and, and we've had to, we have had to, and, and bringing in some intersectionality here too, uh, women of color, have to still have to eat even more, right? Um, yeah. They happen to be the the category who is most in debt from education uh, because they need that, yeah. you know, um, master's or PhD to get the same job that you know a white male needs a bachelor's yeah. degree for. So, so the people pleasing, and then and then if you combine that with like the brain's negativity bias, where it's like it's time for your annual performance review, okay. And there's this recency effect where, all right, they they kind of talk about the the projects you've been work or you've worked on recently, and then if there's you know like one or two things that didn't go quite right, or you're going to hear about that. Mm -hmm. Well, what about the the all these other things that I've been working on throughout the whole course of the year? And this is where in the workplace I would actually I would keep a log of everything I worked on mm -hmm. to the extent I could. I'd share the impact that it had and I had a log so that when it came time to performance review time and I knew that recency effect and that negativity bias was was going to be there because those are so strong I could say well but what about all of this you almost you've got to be like your own advocate in the yeah. work because you're not going to get the, the credit for all of the good stuff it's almost taken for granted because that's that's what you're there for you're there to for the brownie recipe right you're right. there for the, to be yummy and make people feel good and do more work than you should have to. Yeah. Thank you. That's a great point. Susan, you look like you're going to say something. <laughs> well, it's interesting because this is all coming at me and then I'm putting it through my filter of being a family law mediator and dealing with um, sort of tangentially what is happening for women in the workplace mm -hmm. as it manifests in the mediation room in their divorce process. And it's one of the things that I'd really noted lately um, in the past year or two is, is and, and maybe, you know, others have seen this is, you know, I, I felt like there was progress in this world and then the pandemic kind of dragged us back. Um, we got pulled back into as a result of um, everyone being home and homeschooling needing to be done and children being home all of the time. And, um, you know, the issues of work from home and, you know, being 24 seven working and 24 seven caring for home. I think women feel very, or many women and ones that I'm encountering are feeling like we've taken a huge step back. And so, there is now to what Jim said anyway, to use the word is a lot of anger um, yeah. because it's almost worse that we felt like maybe we were moving forward a little bit. And then, you know, after three years of dealing uh, with the pandemic and the repercussions were, were behind the eight ball even further, um, you know, so, and I think that is a, is now carrying back over into the workplace. And so maybe we're seeing, cause I'm seeing women much less willing to be the, what did you call it? Underreacting um, and being a lot more of the overreacting party in, uh, in a, uh, you know, a gender um, <laughs> dispute where I have a male and a female. So I just thought that was interesting as you were saying yeah. it because I feel like just a few years ago, I might've looked at it a little differently. The pandemic kind of shifted some of this conversation. Mm -hmm. You know, that's kind of along the lines, Susan, of what, of what Donna was just sharing. The anecdote about the, the woman who read the book and then went and she applied all of those tactics in the meeting and then she got fired, right? That like, it, you can't just go from one extreme of being a right. mouse, uh, like people pleasing cooperative little mouse to, you know, with, with the, the sledge, 
hammer. You, it, it's, it's too, it's, it's too jarring that yeah. there's a, there's a way of doing this artfully. It, it, it it's an art. You, you almost, you, you have to sort of, if you're going to change something, say about an organization, you, you can't just go, you're doing this wrong. We have to change it. Right. You have to create something adjacent first. You know, there, there's, it's a transition process. It's, it's a process. Yeah. Yeah. I, I don't know if this will help. I, I had a fascinating experience when my daughter moved in with me as a sophomore in high school. Um, my, my wife and I had split and she had gotten into a brouhaha with, with mom and came up to live with dad, figuring could only be better, I guess. <laughs> And uh, I, I just, she was depressed. She had so much to do, so much work. So it, so I had a soccer buddy from way back when come out, who's a child psychologist, uh, psychiatrist actually in Chicago. And I said, I, I don't want you to do anything formal. Just, just meet with us for, just come stay for two or three days and observe things. And what the problem was, as you have described so capably, she was a perfectionist and she would get all bound up unless she could present herself in what she thought was a perfect way. So the, the interesting, in quotes, cure, or you know, I, I would meet with her every night and say, imagine you were spending all the time in the world you wanted on your different homework assignments. How much total time would that be? And it would be like seven hours or nine hours, you know? And so, you know, the reality is you got about two and a half hours here. And so the, the behavioral thing that I was working with her on a nightly basis, I hate to say it, was cutting corners. You know, it's yeah. like, we want to get a best overall result here. What are the things that maybe aren't quite as important? And could we consolidate, you know, this mm -hmm. and coming up with like a game plan for each night, which I am proud to say she has internalized, you know, and, yeah. and so I don't know if that says anything, but at least for my daughter at that time, uh, the combination of both perfectionism and the, the other thing I'll bring up is women multitask. I mean, they're just so much. You know, guys are much better at compartmentalizing and screening out. And so I don't know if this means anything for purposes of anything, you know, conflict resolution or the not, but that was a genuine experience uh, that I had. And, and I, you know, she was bringing this perfectionism, you know, it, it was from the society, I think, yeah, that yeah. just emanated. Uh, so anyhow, Thank uh, you. cutting corners. Sometimes yeah. can be helpful. Yeah. Yeah, that's good. And Anna is so lovely. I love your daughter. Uh, Temple. Jim, thank you. You were you at the very end went exactly where I was thinking. So if anybody has had the pleasure of seeing Mark Gunger, he has the um uh gosh, <laughs> um laughing your way to a better marriage. And the two brains, mm -hmm. right? The men are very compartmentalized. And so it's easy for them to compartmentalize, whereas women, everything is connected, right? And so we're constantly, we cannot disconnect one from the other. That would be like everything we aren't. So what you were, that's where I was going with that, Jim, is like, I do think that it is inherent in how we, you know, think as women. Mm -hmm. and men. Yeah, thank you. We had this really interesting experience with my, um, uh, so I teach this this freshman class on conflict, and we were talking a little bit about gender. And what was interesting was typically the conversation went to either hear stuff about my gender that I don't like, or hear stuff that I don't like that your gender has done to mine. Okay, that I perceive your role has pushed me down, and your your role has tried to make me weak, or you know. So that's usually where the conversation went. And it was so interesting. We had um, we had a student stand up, and they were describing the process of transitioning. And they were born male. They were transitioning to female. And they said, "You don't understand how hard this is to hear because the the transition process is painful. It is exhausting. It is just beyond emotionally and physically draining. But I am doing this because." I aspire to so many of those feminine characteristics that you are downplaying and dismissing. And then we had another student who had, who was, um, who was born female, but was identifying as male. And they stood up and they said, yes, that's exactly what's frustrating me as well. I am so proud of all of the masculine characteristics, 
that I've realized that that describes me better than the female characteristics. And I want to be that. I want to be somebody who can focus completely on one task or I can, you know, cut corners if necessary, but I can do what it takes to get the job done and I can be brave and I can be proud. And I'm, I am proud of those characteristics and sitting here listening to the rest of the class downplay them or dismiss them. It's really negating the, the purpose of this transition journey. I thought that was so eye-opening, right? That that realizing realizing how wonderful a lot of these feminine and masculine attributes are. Like, why can't we come from a place of of being proud of those and bringing that into the workplace instead of you know, Susan? I really I'm identifying with what you're saying about how frustrating things have been, and I'm doing a lot of mediations off of this post COVID that people are noticing a lot of those microaggressions that they hadn't been aware of. So I'm hearing a lot of the concern and the micro expression and the bias, but what I'm not hearing is a lot of like, these are the feminine qualities that I bring and I'm proud of, you know, and there's also a lot of masculine qualities that I have. Jim knows I'm really great at cutting corners and, <laughs> and um, you know, but those, those are qualities that I'm proud of as well. Like, why can't we talk about it in terms of here are the different qualities that make up me and I'm really dang proud of those. Tina, you've had your hand up for a while. I'm sorry. Yeah, true, Jim. <laughs> Thank you. Let me turn my volume down this a little too loud. Uh, I just want to say thank you for this session. Uh, you mentioned um, something at um, don't rock the boat. <laughs> And that's something I've heard a lot from my mom, actually. Hmm. Whenever I said, you know, I'm not, you know, I'm going to call them and tell them they can't do this to you. She would be like, even now, Tina, please don't rock the boat. Yeah. Just let it go. Don't say anything. Um, you don't want to be that way. And... It's just um, something that's learned. It's generational at this point. Um, and I really appreciate speaking about the challenges of Black women. I felt pressured to get a higher degree because hmm. I still felt I wasn't adequate enough. Then I get the higher degree. I get my master's. Now I'm looking at what else can I get. And I'm told I have too much education. One hiring manager told me, well, actually he was speaking kind of out loud to himself, but even though it was there, he didn't. I didn't really feel like he saw me. I'm like, you know that you're walking me out of post-interview. And he says, I'm trying to figure out how you would fit in. Hmm. And I just was so taken back. Like, yeah. what is it about me? I've, I've done my work. I've gotten my degrees. Um, maintain good character. I do a lot of uh, voluntary volunteer work, and but still, there's that block or some, for some reason I can't fit in. Yeah. And so my past history is like, shut up, be pretty, look pretty and welcome our guests, be nice. Mm. And this marginalized feeling and resentment that I do carry. Um, and I, in this, listening to this conversation, I'm recognizing that some of that, those lessons of not feeling brave enough to speak out, to, to rise to my fullest potential, may be coming from what I learned, which is not to rock the boat. Yeah. And, um, so I really appreciate the conversation about, um, as a black woman, is I found it very difficult to uh, meet my level 
a most capable level of success because yet there's someone saying, I'm going to, I'm trying to see how you fit in. Yeah. And um, so I think these conversations are very important to have. And I really appreciate that, that I had the opportunity to be here today to listen. Yeah. Oh, Tina, I'm so glad that you shared that. Thank you. And um, I think you would fit in perfectly with us. I think <laughs> clearly they didn't, they didn't have their, they didn't have their eyes open because I think you, you would fit in anywhere. And I really hope that you can fit in with us. Um, I want to share this really quickly. I know we're running out of time, but I have one more question for the panelists. Um, in the book I talk about, there was a study put on by the National Institute of Health where they had a bunch of kids do a puzzle. And, but then just the idea of this makes me so mad. They had uh, removed one of the pieces. Okay, so all these kids did a puzzle and they went to finish it, but the last piece wasn't there. And so all the girls, those who had been raised very feminine said, oh, I, I think I must have dropped it somewhere or maybe I put it together wrong or it's down here. Somehow I've made a mistake. Whereas all the guys said, oh, you didn't give me all the puzzle pieces. You dropped one of them. You have, you know, you need to give me those pieces. And it was just, that was so eye-opening for me realizing how quickly we get into conflict and how incomplete both of those responses are, right? If I'm always looking in myself, like if Tina is always looking within herself to say, how can I be more perfect? How can I change myself to fit in? She's, she's missing the, the rest of the picture, right? And that's yeah. that's that conditioning that you mentioned. Um, go ahead, Lucia. This, yes, that's how we get the conflict. It's, it's, as Jim says, not two sides to a story, two different stories, and neither one of them is the story, the full story. And this also dovetails with this idea of imposter syndrome. And yeah. I, I put that in quotes because whenever I see that on social media, I bristle because uh, the two psychologists uh, 50 years ago, uh, Pauline Clance and Suzanne Imes, who studied it, were very, very deliberate about calling it imposter phenomenon and not imposter syndrome Good. because a syndrome is something that is individual it's like in your mind it's a pathology and a phenomenon like the puzzle piece right well it, it's not it's not your fault that the you couldn't complete it you didn't drop it you weren't irresponsible it's not your pathology you weren't given the resources so phenomenon it was called imposter phenomenon in order to recognize that it was also a, it was a structural problem where you weren't getting the support and I meant and I can't Claire, remind me, do you talk about the imposter phenomenon in your book? Oh, okay. Right. And so, and so it 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 does this as kind of insidious harm, I think, when we bandy about these these casual social media buzzwords like imposter syndrome, it's everywhere. I see it every single day. And it is, it is. It is doing us a disservice. And you talk about how, oh, you joked, you're good at cutting corners. And Jim knows that. That to me is like, there's a little bit of imposter phenomenon in there. It's like, no, it's not cutting corners. It's being resourceful. Yeah, Jim, just being resourceful. <laughs> Thanks, Lucia. Um, okay, Temple, I want to hear from you really quickly. And then I'd like to hear... Um, I'd like to hear from everyone, okay, from a variety of different genders and backgrounds. What is some, what is one thing that you need to fully let go of conflict? You know, and I, I, I think we all need slightly different things here, right? That satisfy different values inside of us. You can shout them out. You don't have to just say them in the chat. Power, forgiveness of self. I love it. Donna, Susan, Accountability. Jim. Sorry, what? Accountability. Oh, love it. Accountability. Grace, what about you? Mm, I I guess I would say authenticity. Mm. Uh, I mean, I need to really feel like there is, that it's not just a words, that it's actually uh, a resolution or a reconciliation uh, yeah. as opposed to expedience. Love that. Donna, Susan, and then Jim, Roger. 
I would add one A and have the triple A's. So the authenticity, authenticity, awareness, <clears throat> um, and accountability. I think those. You know, I love awareness. it. I love alliteration. Yeah. Right. Right. Write that yeah. down. Stickiness. <laughs> <laughs> the awareness that there even is a conflict, right? I mean, the worst is the situation where you're you come in and say, Thank "Hey, you, you got a problem here," and someone says, "We don't have a problem. You have a problem, right?" That it's just like really, <clears throat> so, yeah, yeah right. That's good. Um, I was Susan. just noticing what Lucia just wrote in um, in the chat, and that's what I was thinking. You know, the thing that's helped me the most is the realization that the conflict, or when it's directed at me. It often has nothing to do with me. It often is, I've had to accept and recognize. Oh, that's good. It's coming, it's it's about them, but because we are that's so good. socialized the way they are, um, you know, like when Tina said, I have to tell you my heart like hurt a little bit when you said, he yeah. said he was trying to see how you'd fit in. And your first thought is what's wrong with me? I'm like, it could, he, what's he, wrong he with was them? thinking we're a bunch of misfits and you're so put together, you're not going to fit in, right? Yeah. But we immediately think it's us. And yeah. so- as I've yeah, gotten much enough to not care as much, um, mm -hmm. the biggest gift of age, I think, has been, mm -hmm. it's about you, not about me. I can let this go. I love that. Yeah, I think I'm still in the mother hen phase of like, oh, but I have to fix everything and it's all on my shoulders. Get older. It goes away. Okay, good. I'm ready. <laughs> yeah, gets a lot Bye. better. Jim, Roger. What was the precise question? Uh, I missed what, what is the thing that you need to really be able to let go of conflict? Is it the feeling of fairness or that you feel heard or that it was a fair process? Not just reach an agreement, but what lets you say, okay, I can release this now. I mean, I, I think it's that you've done your best, you know, you put, and, mm -hmm. and uh, <clears throat> that in fact, for me, that's the, my, my key technique as a mediator is to just say to people, I, my job is to assist you to be at your best and reach the best possible set of solutions. And so that's what we do here. And uh, yeah, so that, and you know, one thing I will say is I've learned more in my own life when discussions come up where you just know it's not the right time or the right context or whatever to say, I get it, we need to talk about this, but not right now. And yeah. actually choose what would be an optimal place and time uh, to do that. And I, I found that to be really helpful. Also, yeah. just refu just refusing to get sucked into conflict. You know, life is short, um, becomes frustrating for the partner. So at some point they say, well, that's not going to work. So, <laughs> but good. also having techniques other than humor, I would say are probably good. Um, I'm working on that. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Donna, Roger. Oh, knowing when to walk away. That's good. Well, and you do cover that in your book. That's really an important point to make that Claire, it's in the book that, that at a certain point you assess, do I, do I stay or do I leave? It's, it's in every chapter, right? Do I stay or do I leave? Yeah. 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 Awesome. yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I, one other thing I want to call out in the book that I thought was, uh, was, is, is really important from the gendered perspective is the notion of, of, as, as multitaskers and empaths as mm -hmm. most women um we 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 see more of conflict in people's faces those micro expressions that people are having and i think that it's become heightened because of zoom because all we see is somebody's face and so we can see the little twitchings that are like are they mm. You know, I'm I'm my early days was as a horse trainer. Are they about to kick me? <laughs> um, and and having I, f I felt like one of the takeaways from your book for me, Claire, was recognizing that we see those things and not assuming that the next thing is going to be a conflict that comes out of it. Um, yeah. and have to, like set some of those things aside to really see what's the real thing thing that's going on here that I need to pay attention right now. So it's a, yeah. it's a little bit like the walk away, but it's like walking away from from even from what you might think the microaggressions are. Or mm. Thank you. Yes. That was interesting. Yeah. 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 I like the um, social media feed. Nice, Lucia. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, that's good. Um, Ricky, uh, Ricky, thanks so much for your comment. So I, yeah, I think I met Ricky 20 years ago, Ricky Amano. Um, and, uh, 
Yeah, so I'm. it's fun to see your name on there again. Hi, Ricky. It's pretty early in the morning in Hawaii, so. Uh, yeah, I was surprised. My that you're fine. <laughs> it's great to see you. Um, Ricky, would you mind, I'd love to hear from you. Is there is there something that you can think of when, like you might have reached an agreement, the conflict is technically done. What is it that for you really lets it, you can let it go? I, I need time because I, I'm sort of a contemplative person and I like to reflect on things. And uh, sometimes if I'm upset about or emotional about something, time helps to give that perspective a little bit more clarity. Hmm. So, um, I mean, that's how it is for me. Yeah, that's good. That's interesting. Um, I know, speaking of, I know that we are at time. Does anyone else have any final thoughts on this one? Um, oh, it varies based on how vested I feel. Absolutely. Um, okay. I've heard a few people say that they just, that either the process has to be very fair or I've heard multiple people say that they need that precision. They need to know that everything is black and white, that all of the I's have been dotted and the T's have been crossed. And then they know that everything is, that everything is going to be okay, that they take comfort in that precision. Um, that's how my husband's side of the family, all of their brain works that way. I am definitely the mediator side where I'm like, it's going to be okay. We'll figure out the details as we go. So that's, that's definitely a different approach that we're figuring out. Um, okay. I know that we are way over time. So thank you so much, everyone. I would love it if we could continue this discussion at some point, maybe on a live talk Tuesday or something. I feel like we're just barely scratching the surface of how gender and our identity and approach to gender affects our, our view of conflict. Um, so I don't know, I, may, I might throw that out. Maybe in a few months, we could all reconvene and continue. Think, think about that national tour and the podcast also. Yeah, I'm sorry. <laughs> love it, Jim. We're going to do it. Thank you. All right. Mwah. Wonderful to see all of you. Have a great rest of your day. Thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. That was great. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.